Joseph's now in the field with the sons of Bilhah. Bilhah has been involved in an incestuous relationship with Reuben, and Joseph is with these sons that are angry at their father, that are angry at their half-brothers to Leah. Does this sound like dysfunction to you? I mean, we got murder, we got incest, we got jealousy, we got anger, we got rage. We got four mothers, for goodness sakes. It's making days of our life look squeaky clean to me. You know? <laughs> and this is the family situation as Joseph is out there minding the sheep. This is his family. Hello? You thought you were bad off. Welcome to Times of Refreshing from sunny OC, California. Times of Refreshing is a Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Bill Crouch. For further information on Times of Refreshing, visit timesofrefreshing.org or email info at timesofrefreshing.org. And now, here's Pastor Bill as he teaches his current series, The Life of Joseph. We're going to start this morning a series looking at the life of Joseph, and I am definitely looking forward to doing that because I know the Spirit's got some things He wants to say to us to encourage our hearts. So we're going to be starting this morning in the 37th chapter of Genesis. We begin to read verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And this is the story of Jacob, Joseph being 17. Why does it say this is the story of Jacob and it's talking about Joseph? Because Joseph is his son. And in the Hebrew culture, if you're talking about the son, you're talking about the father. In the history of Jacob, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now, let me tell you that this boy, 17 years of age, had a lot of issues going on at home. For a start, he had four mothers. Now, that sounds a little bit dysfunctional to me. He's got four mothers. He's got one brother, Benjamin, to his own mother. And the tragedy of his life was that his beautiful mother, Rachel, died giving birth. So they've lost their mum. And him and Benjamin don't have a mum, but in another sense, they've still got three mums. Their dad loved their mother. Rachel was his favourite wife. And so now, Joseph is the favourite son. And there's a certain amount of dysfunction in that right there. Because the father's bringing attention into the family that doesn't need to be there. The two sisters that Jacob married, Leah and Rachel, had a lot of competition happening between them. There's a lot of tension between those girls. That came down to their sons. Not only to their sons, but because they both gave their maidservants to Jacob so that he could have children by them, now there's competition, jealousy, not only between the two sisters, but between the two sisters and their two bondservants, between the two bondservants, I mean, this is just a really difficult sort of thing. Talk about dysfunctional. Joseph's out there looking after the sheep, it says, with the brothers of Bilhah, his father's wife. So he's out there with his half-brothers, but these are the brothers to his mother's handmaiden. The brothers to Leah's handmaiden. They don't want this boy who's now favoured by the father to get the family inheritance. Why should they feel like second-hand sons because their mothers were just handmaidens? Why should they be the working class in the family and this privileged boy get to strut around in a fantastic multicoloured tunic with long sleeves? And in that culture, it was a mark of leadership and royalty. And it was like the father saying, this is my favourite son. He's going to get the family fortune. And you other boys might just have to look after sheep for all your days. Can you see the tensions that were going on? Oh, it doesn't stop there. These sons of Bilhah, who was Joseph's nanny, if you like, had committed all sorts of atrocities. For a start, there's a daughter involved, Dinah. 
Donna was a daughter of Leah. She was raped by the neighbouring tribe in the land where they lived. The father was fairly weak and really didn't do anything about this atrocity that happened to the family. Joseph's brothers were so indignant that their sister was treated this way that they actually devised a scheme to get even with the neighbouring tribe in the land. They said, okay, you can have our sister to marry her, but you're going to need to be like us. You'll need to be circumcised like the men in our nation, in our family. They said, okay, we just want Dinah. So they went ahead, they were circumcised. On the third day, when these guys were so sore that they couldn't even move, the sons of Jacob come in and murdered every one of them. So now we've got murder? Oh, it gets worse. Because if we go back to chapter 35, verse 21, Israel journeyed and pitched the tent beyond the Tower of Edah. And it happened when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went in and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Joseph's now in the field with the sons of Bilhah. Bilhah has been involved in an incestuous relationship with Reuben. And Joseph is with these sons that are angry at their father that are angry at their half-brothers to Leah. Does this sound like dysfunction to you? I mean, we got murder. We got incest. We got jealousy. We got anger. We got rage. We got four mothers, for goodness sakes. It's making days of our life look squeaky clean to me. (laughs) And this is the family situation as Joseph is out there minding the sheep. This is his family. Hello? You thought you were bad off. Twelve brothers, one sister, four mothers, one dad, who's not engaged, is separated from reality in effect. And then you've got this terrible spirit of competition that's just tearing this family apart from the inside out. I want to speak to you about the danger of competition. I mean, it's just terrible in a family. I mean, there's always sibling rivalry, but you just got to be so careful. Jesus was in a situation. I want you to go over to John chapter 4 really quickly. And Jesus was so wise. Of course he was. He was Jesus. John chapter 4, the Pharisees are trying to get him into a little game here so that they can cause division. They were going to use a little bit of jealousy, a little bit of competition. You know, we've got John the Baptist, and we've got John the Baptist's disciples. They're doing good things, and yay for John the Baptist. We've got Jesus, and we've got Jesus' disciples, and they're doing good things. The Pharisees noticed something here. They said, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, (gasps) heaven forbid, heaven forbid. John the Baptist, he's not getting as many disciples as as Jesus is. And the Pharisees heard about it. Oh my goodness, there's going to be trouble in town. Because they want to set up a game. They want to set up a little competition here. They want to cause some trouble between Jesus and and John the Baptist. Jesus is so wise. When he knew that the Pharisees heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize, look what Jesus did. He left Judea. He departed again to Galilee. Jesus said, this is not a game. In fact, he goes to Samaria, the one place that he shouldn't have gone to as far as the Pharisees were concerned, because no self-respecting Jew would even go through Samaria. Jesus said, I'm not playing a competition game with anybody. I don't want to be a winner. I don't want to be a loser. I just want to serve God. You know, I want to serve Jesus. We'll go where he wants us to go. Don't get caught up in a competition. You know what happens when you start comparing yourself with somebody else? One of two things. Either you come out looking pretty good and you stick out the chest and put up the chin and say, I am pretty good. I am somebody. Remember, pride comes before a fall, right? The other thing that can happen is you can say, oh man, I'm just getting walked on here. I must be miserable. I must be a loser. You might as well just give up right now because this is just not happening for me. Everybody's doing better than me. And oh my goodness, what a loser. You know what? Either one, you pick it. Either you're going to come away feeling just a little bit too proud or else you're going to come away feeling like a complete failure. Who said you needed to play a competition game? Who said you needed to start comparing? 
You've been called to be you. Nobody else can be you. You're going to be the best you that anybody's ever been. Because right. no one else can do what you're doing. Be happy with that and be yourself. Give yourself a break. Don't start comparing. Don't start trying to be something that you don't need to be. Be yourself. Don't get caught in competition. Here's Joseph. He's 17 years old. Faced with this incredible situation in his family. He's in the fields with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wife. Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Why did he bring a bad report? Well, probably because he had a position of responsibility. The father favoured him and probably put him in charge of his brothers, what they were doing. The father was already embarrassed by all the activities that these boys had been up to, running around circumcising and killing and murdering and plundering, and oh my goodness. So Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors, and that was the royal robe. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, what's it say? They hated him. So we got hatred. They couldn't speak peaceably to him. Being in that sort of situation, nobody can even talk civilly to anybody else in the family because there's so much tension, nobody can say a nice word. Joseph had a dream, it says in verse 5, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I've dreamed. I want to tell you guys this. There we were. We were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? Here it is. So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Why didn't you just shut up, Joseph? <laughs> and he said, Look, I've dreamed another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to earth before you? And his brothers envied him. And his father kept the matter in mind. We've got hatred. We've got anger. We've got people that can't even say two nice things to each other. And you say to me, Pastor, if you only knew my family, if you only knew what was in my closet, <laughs> you talk about rape and incest, and you talk about murder and deceit and theft. Remember? Joseph's father stole the birthright from his uncle, Esau. And so he's even got an uncle that doesn't want to talk to his father. Theft, deceit, hatred, anger. Out of control, dysfunction, rebellion. Let me tell you something. If God chose Joseph in the middle of that dysfunction, if the Spirit of God called Joseph's name, in the middle of all the problems and tensions of his life, do you think God has got your number? Do you think God's got something for you to do for him? Do you think that the dysfunction of your past is going to put God off for one minute? God loves you. He doesn't want to judge you. He wants to save you. He wants to bless you. He wants to help you. Don't use the dysfunction of your past or your family. Don't give that an excuse to God as to why God can't use you. God wants to use you. Maybe because of all that, he wants to use you more because he's given you opportunities to learn some stuff that other people haven't learned. Maybe the very pains that you've lived through are going to be the things from which you'll minister to other people with such power and applicability because you know what other people's going through. Maybe it's the dysfunction that he's going to use as a mark of honor to give you something that will help other people. Don't hide behind those things and say, God can't use me. 
because of this and that and something else. No, God wants to use you because of that. He didn't plan it, but he'll use it. He's able to work all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Rape and incest and murder, yes, he can use that. He didn't want it, but he can use it. God is still at work in your family too. And he's not finished. Young people. Here's Joseph. He's 17 years old and he has this dream that God has given him in the midst of everything else. Young people, God is giving you dreams now. The things that God is putting in your heart now may just change this nation, may just change this world. Don't take lightly the dreams, the visions, the thing that God is putting into your heart. We could have an Olympic swimmer sitting in here with us this morning. We could have a world-famous musician. We could have a fabulous doctor of sociology and somebody that revolutionizes the computer age because they come up with something that's absolutely fantastic. Do you understand, young people, that the visions and dreams that God is putting in your heart now are those things that are going to redefine the future, not only for you, but for other people as well. Don't say you're too young. Don't say you've got too many problems in your family. Don't say you can't do it, because God's got your number, and he is wanting to use you more than what you would even begin to imagine right now. So own your dreams. Own your visions. Let them be God-given. Let them shape your life. In verse 5, where it says there that Joseph had a dream, in the Hebrew, that word that he had is so strong, it's more like, and a dream had Joseph. Young people, if God's put a dream in your heart, own it, and let it own you, and see where God can take you. I'm not talking about dreams that have got nothing to do with God. I don't want you to be the number one rock star out there next year. I'm not talking about driving around in limousines and having kids screaming. I'm talking about a God-given dream that you will have, but that dream will have you. And it'll change your destiny. And it'll change your family. And it'll change the world. That's what God did through Joseph. That's what he can do through you. Listen what it says in Joel. Listen, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Listen, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servant and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. We live in that day. When the Spirit of God is being poured out on our young people, the young men are seeing visions, young women are dreaming incredible dreams. Own your dreams because they're God given to you to make a difference. Joseph had a dream, but you know what he didn't have? He didn't have a lot of wisdom. You know why I say that? Because when he got this dream, you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to blab it. And he wanted to keep on blabbing it, even long after they wanted to hear any more about his crazy dreams. He had a dream, but he hadn't yet got wisdom. In the 2000 Sydney Olympics, there was a prince that went to the Olympics from Denmark. And he goes into a restaurant, a little place, gets some drinks, had some friends with him. There's a young Australian girl sitting. They meet. She doesn't know he's a prince. She doesn't know he's royalty. And they strike up a friendship that blooms into a relationship. Earlier this year, this young Australian girl married the prince of Denmark. A young Australian girl is now a princess of Denmark. Now, she's got position. She's got to learn wisdom. She's been made royalty. She's got to learn appropriateness and wisdom for her position. 
What am I saying? You are all being adopted into the family of God. You're his sons, you're his daughters. You'll never be more royal than what you are right now. You've been given gifts, you've been given dreams, you've been given visions. You know, one thing God doesn't give you straight up front is the wisdom to be able to walk in those things. You're going to have to learn that over a course of a lifetime. Jesus said about throwing your pearl before a swine. It's interesting because you think about the story now of the prodigal son. The prodigal son was royal. He had everything. What happened when he decided that he knew best? He ends up in a pigsty eating the pig slop. That's not a place for a royal son to be. Jesus said, don't cast your pearl before swine. Here's a pearl with swine. What happens when he comes around? He gets out of the pigsty. He says, this ain't for me. He goes back home. The father gives him a reception, gives him a robe, gives him a ring, and treats him like royalty. Why? Because he's a prince. He thinks he's supposed to be eaten with pigs, but he's a prince. Let me put it to you this way. God will give you gifts, but you have to develop the character to carry those gifts. You have to learn royalty. You have to learn responsibility. You have to learn wisdom. Because if you don't have the character to sustain the gifts that God has given to you, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Young people, because you've got incredible giftings, you've got incredible dreams, you've got incredible visions from God, let me tell you, you have got to now learn wisdom. Learn to be appropriate. Learn to open your mouth when you need to open your mouth, but you better learn when you need to keep your mouth closed because Jesus said, don't go throwing your pearls before the swine. Let me tell you, if you've got a pearl, you don't throw pearls. Pearls are not for throwing. That is not appropriate behavior. If you've got a pearl, you've got to learn to treasure that thing. You don't need to have pearls and swine together. Jesus was saying, Learn to be appropriate. Learn wisdom. Learn to grow in understanding so that your gifts don't take you somewhere where your character can't keep you. Young people, learn wisdom. Get understanding. Learn what it is to be royal. You're not going to open yourself up to ridicule because somebody is always going to be there to tear you down and to tell you, who do you think you are to have a dream like that? You say, well, because I'm royalty. <laughs> I'm a princess. I just happen to be a princess. I happen to be a prince. And God's given it to me. Let me tell you, I was out at Best Buy the other night, Wednesday night, and I thought I had a bunch of invitations to the men's conference, and I said, I'm not going to leave them here. I was sitting on a counter. I went over to Best Buy until they run me off for soliciting, but for a while I stood out. <laughs> yeah. Anyway... For a while, I stood at the front door, and I'm giving out invitations, and there was this young man, you know, he had tats up both arms, and he had a little bit of body piercing, elephant tusk out of here. <laughs> I, don't know. Uh, I, I just wanted to give him an invitation, so I gave him an invitation, and he surprised me. He said, yeah, man, you know, I'm, I'm sort of between churches right now. I'm really looking for a cool church, and, and this would be great. And I said, great, you know, come along, come along. It's good. But I went away a little bit sad because even though God's called his name, I don't think yet he's learned what it means to be a prince because I saw by the way that he was conducting himself that night that he was really trying harder to fit in with the world than to fit in with royalty. He had not yet learned appropriateness and wisdom. I hope he does. This is what I'm saying to you, young people. Be responsible. The gifts, the calling, the visions and the dreams that you carry require you to learn wisdom, appropriateness. Stop worrying about trying to fit in with the world and try to learn what it means to be part of a royal family. Be who you are. Accept the fact that God wants to put a robe on you. He wants to put a ring on your finger. He wants to give a reception in your honor and put a crown on your head and say, You're mine! Learn appropriateness. And don't be conned by the world to just go along with what everybody else is doing. You're too good for that. You are absolutely too good for that. Remember, 
Your gifting, your calling can never take you where your character will not keep you. Learn wisdom, learn manners, learn character, learn appropriateness. Learn how to appreciate the precious gifts that God has given you. And don't cheapen them by throwing them out there where they don't need to be thrown. God believes in you, young people, and we believe in you. And we believe in what God wants to do in your life. And we pledge that we will do what we can do as adults, not only to encourage you, but to help you learn appropriateness. Father, we just thank you that we're called to be your people. We're called to be agents of change in this world, that we are called to be people that will make a difference because we're different people. We're not called to fit in. We're not called to compromise. We're called, Lord, to stand for something. We're called to be different. We're called to be representatives of Jesus Christ, part of his family, royalty, class acts. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to do what we need to do to learn to be the people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're listening to the teaching of Pastor Bill Crouch from Sunny OC, California. For further information on Times of Refreshing Ministries, visit timesofrefreshing.org or email info at timesofrefreshing.org. If you wish, you can call us at 1-866-98-FRESH. That's 1-866-98-37374. Or you can write to Times of Refreshing Ministries, P.O. Box 6807, Huntington Beach, California, 92615. Thanks for your time today and please let us know how this program has refreshed your life. And remember, it's your generosity that makes this program possible. Thank you. And now here's a final word of blessing from our teacher, Pastor Bill Crouch. And now may times of refreshing be yours from the hand of God. Let his grace cover you, let his peace surround you, his love embrace you, and let his words satisfy you and make you strong, that you would be to him like a beautiful garden and like a spring that never runs dry. May you drink deeply from the river of God's blessing until the fullness of his life flows out from you like a stream of living water with strength for your body, health for your mind and wholeness for your spirit until that wonderful day when at last you will stand before your Jesus and see him face to face. We'll be waiting for you again next time for more Times of Refreshing with Pastor Bill Crouch.